The death of John Kennedy Jr. was a terrible loss. The loss of his wife Carolyn and her sister Lauren was an unspeakable blow to their families and the other people who loved them. John embodied an extremely rare combination of wealth, charisma, and human decency. As we have seen and will see, the Kennedy family members have lived and died giving their best in service to the people of America and to the world. What might John and Carolyn have done for their country and the world if they had lived? Let's try not to get lost in the swamp of facts surrounding their deaths. And let's try instead to stay rooted in an appreciation of what we lost when they died. In getting started, there are some preliminary points we should discuss. The first has to do with understanding the forces at work in recent and current U.S. history. State-sponsored racism and genocide were invented by the rich and powerful in this country and their involvement with Hitler cannot be overestimated. For example, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefeller Bank in Paris, seized the assets of their Jewish depositors and then ordered Hitler to tell them to do it. Which, of course, he did. The Nazis who run this country ordered Hitler around. Hitler represented a dictatorship of the rich bastards, of the largest corporations, of the power elite against the Democrats, who think society ought to be run by the people and for the benefit of the people. But the most powerful Nazis were not in Germany, they were right here. The Rockefellers and the Harrimans, the Fords and the DuPonts helped to create Hitler, helped to promote him and armed him. And they didn't lose World War II. Hitler did, the German people did, the Jewish people did. But the Rockefellers and the Harrimans, the Fords and the DuPonts, they won. After eight years as president in 1960, Eisenhower finally figured out that he was surrounded by Nazis. He called them the military-industrial complex, and he tried to warn the new president, John Kennedy, that these guys were trying to take over the government and end democracy. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The Kennedy family has a truly amazing history. Joe, the oldest son, died in a bomber over Germany fighting Nazis. Jack died fighting the Nazis here, the military-industrial complex. They wanted the Vietnam War as an excuse to loot the U.S. Treasury. When as president, John Kennedy Sr. opposed them, they shot him down like a dog in the streets of Dallas. Bobby Kennedy, the third brother, took up the fight against the military-industrial complex and ran for president promising to end the Vietnam War that his brother was murdered for opposing. Bobby was murdered after winning the California primary. My thanks to all of you and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. The murder, as usual, was blamed on a lone nut, Sirhan Sirhan. But the L.A. County coroner, Thomas Noguchi, said that the powder burns on the back of Robert Kennedy's head indicated that the shot was fired from within one inch. We came to conclusion that the muzzle distance would be as a uh, one inch from the right uh, ear edge. But the eyewitnesses all said that Sir Han never came near enough to deliver the fatal shot to the back of the head. And Sir Han was right in front of me, uh, right in front of the steam table and between me. In so front? In front, yeah. I had him right in front of me. I didn't let him pass me. I had my left foot on his knees and I pushed him over. And, uh, well, the time, uh, how far would the gun muzzle be from Senator Kennedy's head? About a foot and a half, I would say, foot and a half, two feet. More shots were fired than Sir Han's gun was capable of firing. Sir Han said he did not remember firing the shots and that he had absolutely no reason to hate Robert Kennedy. Many investigators concluded that Sir Han was a victim of mind control, a decoy sent to divert attention while the real killer fired the fatal shot. Edward Kennedy, the fourth brother, after becoming a senator, barely escaped death in a plane crash that broke his back and killed everyone else on board. 
and his political career was ruined when someone drugged him and drove his car off a bridge. He survived, but his hopes to run for president did not. This is not some stupid, mysterious family curse. For 50 years, the Kennedys have had a heroic family tradition of fighting real Nazis, of defending the democratic interests of the people against other families with anti-democratic traditions. These Nazis have been instrumental in the murders of the Kennedys. These Nazis, the Illuminati, the rich bastards, they are the Kennedy curse. The death of John Kennedy Jr. must be seen in this light. Who would want to kill a harmless boob like John Kennedy Jr.? It's a common question that needs to be answered. John was not a harmless boob, and the men who murdered John's father had good reason to fear that he would go after his father's killers. John was not your average stupid spoiled rich kid. For example, this was his birthday. He was three. Not your average birthday party. All the women were dressed in black. His mama was no fool. Minutes after the assassination, they wanted her to change her dress. She said, no, I want the American people to see what they did to my husband. What they did to my husband. She didn't buy any of this lone nut crap. She did her best to help her children grow up normal and healthy. She didn't send them away to one of those factories where they manufacture rich kids into sick and twisted upper-class scum. She tried hard to keep them normal. But when John wanted to be an actor, she let him know that he had more serious work to do. George Magazine was that work. Infotainment, but real info. Not the stupidifying garbage you get on 150 channels of cable. Entertaining, engaging, but smart and real and important. Perhaps too smart, too real, and too important. He published at least two very, very dangerous articles. The first was written by the mother of the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin, the liberal peace-seeking Prime Minister of Israel. This woman said that Rabin's assassination was a plot engineered by the Mossad, the Israeli CIA. She argued, essentially, that her son was a tool of the Mossad, that he could never have penetrated the security around Rabin if it weren't an inside job. Wow. Publishing an article that encourages people to consider the possibility that their own security might be involved in attacks on their own citizens based on the fact that those attacks could not have succeeded if the security agencies had done their jobs. I don't think we can overemphasize this point. John Kennedy devoted his life to trying to bring the people the whole dangerous truth. He paid for this devotion to the people and to the truth with his life. The day John died, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak was in the United States, not to suggest anything as crass as that Barak was involved in John's death. I was in the country too, but I didn't do it. But there can be no question that Barak's visit was preceded by the arrival of an army of security personnel, including, of course, the Mossad. They were here. They arrived in advance of John's death in order to make preparations for the Prime Minister's visit, of course. But after John's death, a Mossad agent planted this lie in the New York Post. And as we have just seen, they had reason to want John Kennedy Jr. dead. Not only did John refuse to endorse the Warren Commission and say, yes, yes, of course, his father had been murdered by a lone nut, how awful. Not only did John refuse to attack Oliver Stone in his movie JFK, but George Magazine published a second very dangerous article, this one written by Oliver Stone himself. The article Stone wrote was about how the rich and powerful have always assassinated their political opponents throughout history, including John's father. John took this guy who said that the rich and powerful forces had killed his father, and he paid him, and he published him, and he actually encouraged people to listen to him as if he had something legitimate to say. Was John incredibly brave or just stupid? I vote for brave. And perhaps most dangerous of all, John was a threat to his father's killers because when he decided to run for political office, he was going to win. Did People Magazine pick George W. as the sexiest man in the world? No, they didn't. They picked John. When he spoke in public, he had a natural ease and presence. He was what they call charismatic. Over a quarter century ago, my father stood before you to accept the nomination for the presidency of the United States. 
America is better because of the leadership of Edward Kennedy. Thank you. He has shown that an unwavering commitment to the poor, to the elderly, to those without hope, regardless of fashion or convention, is the greatest reward of public service. Which brings us to our next introductory point. If there was foul play in the death of John Kennedy Jr., and we will show absolutely conclusively in a few minutes that there was, George W. Bush and his father have to be seen as the prime suspects. It's an obvious point, really. As we saw in JFK II, the Bush connection, George Herbert Walker Bush helped to supervise the assassination of President Kennedy, and from that moment on, his political future was made. He was a made man. He lost the race for Senate. They gave him a seat in Congress. He lost again for the Senate. They gave him a job in the White House. He lost the primaries to Reagan. They made him vice president, and he ruled while Reagan napped for eight years. Does little Georgie's political career show such intervention, such involvement by the dark lords of Nazi politics? You be the judge. A few weeks after John Kennedy Jr.'s death, little Georgie lost to John McCain in the New Hampshire primaries. Now, when you lose in New Hampshire, you're supposed to see the rats scurrying from your sinking ship and jumping on board with the winner. After New Hampshire, the money flows from the losers to the winner. That's how it's supposed to go, as water runs downhill and as day follows night. But in 1999, that's not how it went. Water ran uphill. Night was followed by a much deeper darkness and money flowed like a plague into the coffers of George W. Bush after his loss in New Hampshire. Now, how can you explain this? Why didn't that loss increase financial support for John McCain by the big money establishment? He was clearly more electable. Why did that loss result in a sudden and enormous increase in financial backing for George W.? These millions of dollars allowed Bush to smear and slime McCain's image with incredible vigor, to buy up the endorsements of the religious groups, of the veterans groups, and to call virtually every voter in the state and tell them the lie that McCain had an illegitimate black child. Why did the big money establishment overwhelmingly support Bush at this time instead of siding with McCain? Was it because McCain was a war hero and Bush was a draft dodger? Was it because Bush had been an openly drug-abusing alcoholic and McCain had led a conservative lifestyle? How do you explain it? It's not so difficult. They needed a stooge, someone they could trust to shut up and do what he was told as they planned and executed the murder of 3,000 Americans to anger the American people into a series of unending wars, killing tens of thousands more so that they could steal hundreds of billions of dollars from the national treasury. Now. If his father got his seat at this table by killing President Kennedy, who did little Georgie have to kill to get his seat at this table? It's a fair question. And now it's time to ask the key question you always ask your prime suspect. Where was Georgie the night John Kennedy Jr. was murdered? Go to a news retrieval service and search every newspaper in the world. You'll find that Friday, July 16, 1999, the day John Kennedy Jr. died, Bush was in Iowa in the morning, running for president, flipping pancakes and kissing babies. The polls showed that he was losing in New Hampshire to John McCain. You might see this as a crucial weekend for campaigning, but Bush got on a bus at 10 o'clock that Friday morning and disappeared for three days. On Saturday, the media ran to Al Gore to ask his response to John Jr.'s death so he could say how sad and sorry he was. And Gore said that he would cancel all his campaign rallies for the weekend out of respect for the family's losses. And then the reporters ran to the Bush campaign headquarters. I mean, here's Bush, a president's son. What does he think of the death of another president's son? That was their angle. And is he going to cancel his campaign appearances like Gore? But do you know what Bush said? Nothing. He was nowhere to be found. His staff couldn't say where he was, what he was doing, or even when he would be back. Although they were sure, they said, that if they could find him, he would of course express his deep sorrow and sympathy for the family's loss. The last preliminary point to be made, based on the events of John's life, is that he was not a W. He was not an inconsequential, drug-using, heavy-drinking, irresponsible boob. He was a responsible, smart, dynamic, responsible, good-hearted, devastatingly handsome, responsible talent with a winning personality and a commitment to make the world a better place. Did I mention how responsible he was? Specifically and most importantly for us today, he was an enormously responsible pilot. 
without a dissenting opinion, the nine flight instructors who watched John fly over the course of 17 years agreed that he was methodical about his flight planning and very cautious regarding his aviation decision making. How did such a careful pilot end up crashing into the sea, killing his wife and his sister-in-law, and possibly his unborn child? How? Well, that's what we're here to find out. The National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, investigates all airplane crashes. They found no evidence in this case of any mechanical problems. The weather was clear and the moon was visible. The radar report shows that John's plane just suddenly dropped, as if someone had grabbed the controls, the steering yoke, and pushed it forward as hard as they could. It looks like a suicide. And it's standard in any accident investigation to examine the state of mind of the individuals involved to assess the possibility that the crash was not an accident at all, but a suicide. So let's do that quickly. John and his wife Carolyn were famous for a fight they had in public, and friends said that for three years they had disagreed about whether and when to have children. But in May, two months before the crash, John was very upbeat about his marriage and told Toronto businessman Keith Stein that he was looking forward to fatherhood. Stein said, quote, he talked about having kids as if it were imminent in their future. On John's fatal last Friday, he told his staff not to worry about their jobs because, quote, as long as I'm alive, this magazine will continue to publish, unquote. This would be a really cruel thing for a guy to say who was planning to kill himself in a few hours. On his last Friday afternoon, John and his wife's sister, Lauren, arrived at the Essex County Airport in Caldwell, New Jersey at 7.30. Witnesses say Carolyn arrived 15 minutes later at 7.45, and yet, while conditions worsened as the skies became more and more hazy as the sun went down, they sat around for 45 minutes. Why? What were they waiting for? This is an anomaly. It doesn't make any sense. In any case, at 8.30, 45 minutes after arriving, John, his sister-in-law, Lauren, and his wife took off from Caldwell, New Jersey, and headed northeast towards Martha's Vineyard, ascending to a cruising altitude of 5,500 feet. An NTSB radar analysis shows the final moments of the flight in great detail. At 9.33, the plane, still headed northeast, began descending from its cruising altitude of 5,500 feet. At 9.38, the plane, while still descending, began a slight turn to the right so that it was headed due east, lining itself up with the southern coast of Martha's Vineyard. This was John's favorite approach to the Martha's Vineyard Airport since it allowed him to fly over his mother's home on the southern shore where he spent many childhood summers. At 9.38 and 20 seconds, the plane completed the turn and stopped its descent. The plane was now at 2,200 feet. But it's against FAA regulations for a plane to fly below 2,500 feet without first contacting the tower. So in a manner which is absolutely typical of John's carefulness in following procedures, he brought the plane back up to 2,500 feet. At 9.38 and 50 seconds, with wings level, the plane was on final approach with 14 miles to go to the airport. At 200 miles per hour, the plane would land in about five minutes. At 9.39, John contacted the tower. We don't know how long this conversation lasted, but at 9.40 and 15 seconds, one minute and 15 seconds later, the plane suddenly dove out of the sky, falling 2,500 feet in 45 seconds, crashing into the water at 200 miles per hour. been told by the Coast Guard that in fact there are
is now evidence of a last communication last night with JFK Jr.'s plane as it was making an approach to Martha Vine Martha's Vineyard Airport. Petty Officer Todd Bergun joins us from the Coast Guard base in Boston. He is the uh, a petty officer and a public information officer. Uh, thank you for being with us, sir. What can you tell us about this last communication with JFK Jr.'s plane? All I really know at this time is that it was at 9.39 p.m., and it was with the FAA, and it was on its final approach to Martha's Vineyard. So at 9.39, to the best of your information, JFK Jr. made a contact with the uh, airport, with the flight controllers, the correct. air traffic controllers at Martha's Vineyard Airport that he was on a final descent. That, that is correct. At 9.39. Todd Bergen is a professional. What you heard him doing just now is what he does every day. He answers reporters' questions about the Coast Guard's involvement in rescues of plane and ship disasters. We have seen that at precisely 9.39, the plane had stopped descending and paused at 2,500 feet. FAA regulations require that the plane pause at 2,500 feet, contact the tower, and receive permission to continue. And Bergen reports that it was at this precise moment, 9.39, that Kennedy did in fact contact the tower. Bergen's report is absolutely consistent with the radar information that we got from the NTSB that was used to reconstruct the last moments of the plane before it crashed. Bergen's report is absolutely credible. If he had been off by one minute on either side, if he had said 938, he'd have been wrong. The plane was still executing the turn and was not yet on final approach. If he had said 940, he'd have been wrong. The plane was on its way into the water. How was he able to identify the exact minute that the plane was holding at 2,500 feet, waiting to get clearance from the tower before descending? He had to have gotten that information from FAA flight personnel in the tower at Martha's Vineyard Airport, that Kennedy indeed contacted the tower at 939. There is no other possible explanation. This question of radio contact with the Martha's Vineyard Tower is enormously important for a couple of reasons. You see, whenever you contact air traffic control, your particular radar blip is then entered into the FAA's air traffic computer system. If anywhere on your flight path your plane should happen to descend below 100 feet, the computer will immediately set off an alarm at the FAA traffic control facility. So therefore, as a result of Kennedy's 939 radio contact with the tower, the plane should have set off a low altitude alarm in the FAA's traffic control offices when the plane descended below 100 feet. The FAA should have begun the search at 940 when this low altitude alarm went off. They knew before the plane hit the water. FAA regulations also require that a search be begun any time a plane contacts the tower on its final approach and then fails to land within five minutes. As a result of John Kennedy's radio contact with the tower then, the FAA also should have begun a search at 944 when John Kennedy's plane failed to land. How long did it take the FAA to begin searching the approaches to the Martha's Vineyard Airport? If this outrageous delay was actually part of a criminal conspiracy, then it's obvious that this information about John Kennedy contacting the tower would have to be disappeared. And it was disappeared. At 12.30, Bergen was removed. He was silenced. He disappeared from any further reports of any kind. In fact, all government agencies, including the FAA and the Coast Guard, suddenly went silent and reporters were now referred to the Pentagon. That's right. Suddenly the Pentagon became the center for reporting what was supposedly a peacetime activity of search and rescue, resulting from a peacetime accident. All right, we're told the Pentagon uh, news conference is about to get underway. Let's yeah, go there right now. This is a, an easily used uh, facility. Uh, both the Department of Defense and the Coast Guard and to try to describe to you what the uh, Pentagon overtly took control of the news reporting of the crash. This was certainly extraordinary and Lieutenant Colonel Steve Rourke was brought out to do the official line. I, I only know for sure that they did not talk to the tower at Martha's Vineyard. No need to mention Todd Bergen's report because it now officially never happened. Nothing to see here, folks. Now let's move on. Uh, along the route, they may have spoken to uh, to somebody, but certain uh, not at Martha's Vineyard. 
Certainly not at Martha's. They never made contact with the tower at Martha's Vineyard. Uh, that's my understanding. Colonel Rourke is lying. There's no way that Bergen's report could be false. None. The news people didn't believe Rourke for one second, and they continued all through the day to report what Bergen at, at had told them. At 10 o'clock, and as we've been telling you uh, all afternoon, his last contact with Martha's Vineyard Airport was apparently at 9.39 with air traffic controllers about 17 miles off of Martha's Vineyard, and that is now... Of course, if they wanted to make Bergen's report go away, the killers also had to shut down the honest people at FAA who had told Bergen about the tower contact, and they did. Do you have any knowledge about that or whether they contacted Otis or whether they contacted any other tower within the region? No, I do not have any more information and the FAA would be a better point of contact. I have time for one waiting more. to hear from the Federal Aviation Administration on anything they might add as a result of listening to the tapes, the conversations between or the transmissions between uh, the airplane John F. Kennedy Jr.'s airplane and air traffic controllers on the ground. Your sister-in-law. It would be really interesting to hear from the Federal Aviation Administration. They must have by now listened to the audio tapes of the air traffic controllers' conversations with JFK Jr.'s airplane from the time that it left. I'm surprised that we haven't heard anything from the FAA just yet. Mm, hopefully we will hear something from them soon that will give us an indication of what might have gone wrong. From the radar screens, the F. AA has said nothing this afternoon. We've only heard from uh, the Coast Guard officials and for the Civil Air Patrol people, but this is what we have with JFK Jr.'s plane. This report by the official Coast Guard spokesman was probably the most significant piece of information that appeared in the early reports and was then washed away. But it certainly wasn't the only piece of professional on-the-scene reporting that was disappeared from the news by the conspirators at the Pentagon. At about uh, 0215 this morning, Coast Guard Operations Center at Group Woods Hole in uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts, received a telephone call from a family friend indicating that John F. Kennedy, his wife Carolyn Bissett, and his sister-in-law Lauren Bissett, who had earlier departed from Caldwell Airport in Fairfield, New Jersey, were late in arriving at Martha's Vineyard. Now wait. John Kennedy Jr.'s plane was expected at the family home at 10. Friends of Lauren's were expecting her at the Martha's Vineyard Airport at 9.30, but no one reported the plane missing for four hours, not until 2 a.m.? That's not a very believable story, is it? And it's not true either. Connection at that point, because that's a question that I've had. If they knew the plane was missing, and this is what I heard earlier this morning, that there were family members, a family member of, of Lauren, or a friend of, of uh, Lauren Bissett, the sister-in-law of John Kennedy Jr., Carolyn, Carolyn's husband. They were apparently waiting for her at the airport, and when she didn't arrive... These friends of Lauren Bissett, waiting for her at the Martha's Vineyard Airport, contacted Adam Budd, a licensed pilot and airport employee who first contacted the Martha's Vineyard Tower and then called FAA officials in Bridgeport, Connecticut to report that, quote, Kennedy Jr.'s plane was overdue. Any one of these phone calls should have caused the FAA to begin a search. Instead, FAA officials did nothing. Rescue and search crews were contacted early this morning when family members expecting uh, the Kennedys at Martha's Vineyard at about 10 o'clock heard nothing, contacted the airport, were told there had been no word from the plane. They contacted FAA officials who then... In response to these phone calls, the FAA officials did nothing. One hour later, at 11 p.m., Senator Edward Kennedy became involved. He contacted the FAA to let them know that the plane was missing. A U.S. senator is going to be able to get some action, right? Wrong. The FAA officials did nothing. Pretty outrageous. And as you can imagine, it attracted the attention of the reporters trying to cover the story. And they tried to grill Colonel Rourke about this outrageous discrepancy. Linda Killian from People Magazine. I just wonder if there's any information about why when the plane was expected in about 9.30, if there's any idea why you were not notified until 3 in the morning and how important... Well, now you see why the Pentagon had to take over the press coverage. That way, if some terrorist like Linda Killian at People Magazine tried to throw a bomb or ask a good question, they could just cut her off. 
This question of why the plane was not officially reported missing until 2 a.m. never got answered, never got asked again, and never got any mention in any of the media. But so did the Kennedys just give up trying to get a search started? No, they didn't. At 2.15 a.m., a family friend, Carol Radowell, got the bright idea to contact the Coast Guard. The plane was flying over water. Perhaps the Coast Guard could act on its own and search the water, even if the FAA was refusing to cooperate and search the skies. But let's first acknowledge here that if a plane is missing and you call the Coast Guard instead of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, it's either because you're retarded and you don't know the difference between flying a plane and sailing a boat, or it's because you have exhausted all hope of getting the FAA to act. The Kennedys aren't retarded. By 2.15 in the morning, they were desperate and they called the Coast Guard to look for a plane. The Coast Guard cooperated. I guess you could call it that. They contacted the FAA. I, Meshugana. But at least now the FAA was on notice that another government agency was involved. They had to do something, and so the FAA did something. The FAA contacted the Air Force, the government agency most obviously criminally involved in the events of September 11th. The Air Force contacted the Coast Guard, letting them know that the Air Force, not the Coast Guard, was now in charge, letting them know that the Coast Guard should now do what the military tells them to do, and the Air Force then sent the Coast Guard on a wild goose chase to search an area a hundred miles away from anywhere the plane might have gone down. Meanwhile, from 2 a.m. until 7.30 a.m., the Air Force and the FAA did nothing. At 6.30 a.m., on a Saturday morning, Ted Kennedy woke up John Podesta, Clinton's chief of staff. At 7 a.m., Podesta woke up Clinton. At 7.15, Clinton told Podesta to call the Air Force and tell them that if they didn't have a search underway in 15 minutes, they shouldn't bother to come to work on Monday because they would all be fired if they weren't in jail. The Air Force said, Oh, you want a search? We'll give you a search. And they scattered two planes and two helicopters across 20,000 square miles of ocean. The Air Force kept them searching this vast expanse for the next five and a half hours. Now, obviously, not everybody at FAA was involved in a criminal conspiracy with Colonel Rourke and the Air Force and the Pentagon. After all, Bergen got his information about the tower contact from some honest person at the FAA, and many other professionals at FAA also did their jobs as usual. For example, studying the radar tapes of Kennedy's flight, performing what is called an NTAP radar analysis. The name of this type of review of the radar records, NTAP, means that you go back to takeoff. You start with the plane identifying itself to the tower, giving its N number, its registration number. In this case, N529JK. The plane's radar blip is identified at takeoff, and this particular blip is then followed along its flight path until it disappears, indicating the crash site. The New York Times says this information was available at 5 a.m and hard-working, honest news people with contacts at FAA got a hold of this radar information, and they put it into their TV broadcasts, and they put it up on the screen at the same moment that they were asking Colonel Rourke to explain why, eight hours after the results of the NTAP radar study were available, the surge vessels were still scattered all over the Atlantic, when the radar showed definitively that the plane had gone down on the western approach to Martha's Vineyard. Colonel Rourke, uh, Martha Raddatz from ABC. Uh, ABC is reporting today that the plane possibly went into a dive about 19 miles off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Does that mean the search will start focusing right there and you will pull away from, say, Long Island or other areas you're searching, or will you pretty much go about what you're doing? We'll continue on the same track that we're on, uh, which is to search the entire area. We have nothing that uh, absolutely uh, pinpoints one area as opposed to another, so we can't uh, rule out the entire flight. The reporter can't believe what she's hearing. Can it be that this guy, the spokesman for a day, chosen by the Air Force, doesn't even know about the radar information? So she asks him. Are you hearing those reports at all about 19 miles off Martha's Vineyard? The uh, radar... I'm sorry, go ahead. The radar indicated that at some point that the plane may have gone into a dive? The uh, radar position is, is just a, a last uh, possible position, and, and it's... Uh... The radar position was not just a last possible position. It was a crash site. 
This is the official radar report from the NTSB documents. The plane dropped 1,200 feet in the first 12 seconds. This is 12 times what would be considered a normal rate of descent. The next 30 seconds is probably 50 times normal. The plane then disappeared from the radar. Rourke had this information, but this is not an area of special interest to him. And Colonel Rourke didn't simply misspeak at the press conference. He told this lie to anyone who would listen, including the New York Times. But back at the Pentagon press conference, the lying is just getting started. Just a, a last uh, possible position, and, and it uh, can't even be confirmed that, that it's the aircraft we're looking for. So again, we can't rule it out. It can be confirmed. It had been confirmed. Remember, the NTAP radar study begins by identifying the plane at takeoff. So again, Rourke is lying. But let's take a moment to clarify who this Colonel Steve Rourke is. Lieutenant Colonel Steve Rourke, R-O-A-R-K. He's currently the director of the U.S. Air Force's National Search and Rescue School, which is at the U.S. Coast Guard Station in Yorktown, Virginia. He is the former director of the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center. He is physically in the Rescue Coordination Center right now. So Steve Rourke is very senior. He is the former director of the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center. Uh, Colonel Rourke is a, is a HH-53 helicopter pilot. He's personally been involved in over a thousand rescues, search and rescue operations in his career. And uh, Steve, are you there? Yes, sir, I am here. Colonel Rourke may not know anything about what happened to John Kennedy Jr., but he does know about search and rescue in general. He's intimately familiar with what an NTAP means. He must be vastly familiar with radar tapes. So Colonel Rourke's errors are not simple mistakes. He's lying his head off. But you answer the question, why? I guess, I don't know why, is a perfectly legitimate answer to that question. But can't we do better than that? Can we find any other evidence that suggests a more qualified, more specific, more useful answer than, I don't know? I think so. The obvious answer is that they were trying to keep the rescue craft out of the crash area. Our search and by about one o'clock this afternoon, uh, we had narrowed that focus down to an area of about 17 miles uh, southwest of Martha's Vineyard, consistent with the uh, kind of flight path that would we would expect flying via VFR from Caldwell, New Jersey, to Martha's Vineyard. At about that same you get time, the point. The FAA knew where Kennedy's plane had gone down before it hit the water. The NTAP radar study verifying where Kennedy's plane had crashed was completed at 5 a.m., but Rourke and the Air Force kept the Coast Guard searching this vast expanse for the next five and a half hours. It wasn't until after one o'clock in the afternoon, when a suitcase washed up on the beach with Lauren Bassett's name tag on it, that the Coast Guard, acting on its own, was finally able to focus on something remotely resembling the crash area. One last point on this question. All civil aircraft are required to carry an emergency beacon, or an ELT. These emergency locator transmitters are crash activated. If a plane crashes, the ELT sends out a signal that is received by a network of satellites that can instantly locate the crash within a matter of a few feet. So, where did ABC get the information for this picture, which shows a beacon in the crash area? Obviously, the beacon went off as it was supposed to, the signal was received by the satellites as it was supposed to be, and although news reporters at ABC managed to get a hold of this information, it was not passed on to the rescue teams in the Coast Guard and the Civil Air Patrol. But we already know how that works. The question then is why? Why didn't Rourke and the others involved in this criminal conspiracy want the searchers to know where to search? Again, I don't know is a pretty legitimate answer, but, again, can't we do better? Well, let's keep putting together the pieces we can and see what kind of picture we get. At 2 a.m., as soon as the Coast Guard tried to involve itself, the military took charge of the search. As we've seen, they hit or destroyed many pieces of vital information. In addition, the Mafia, the military, and their accomplices have also seen fit to lose many crucial pieces of information, pieces of information which are essential to our being able to see and understand what happened.
through dumb luck and hard work and invaluable help from others, we've been able to replace many of these missing pieces. We also heard that they picked up a, um, a radio beacon, the emergency beacon that these airplanes are equipped with and they're set to go off on impact. And that we now know, for example, that it is more than likely that John's emergency beacon, the ELT, went off and was received, but that this piece of the puzzle was removed. We can easily replace it. We found out that Adam Budd reported the plane missing at 10 o'clock. We found pieces of the puzzle that show the family, including Senator Kennedy, also made reports, beginning only a short while after Adam Budd's report at 10 p.m. and continuing throughout the night. The NTAP radar information, as well as the news that John Kennedy contacted the Martha's Vineyard Tower on his final approach, also got lost. As a result, 15 and a half hours of search time were also lost. And what emerges from this scene is a conspiracy between the upper levels of the Air Force and FAA to manipulate events, draw a false picture of John as a careless and incompetent pilot, and to prevent the search and rescue teams from arriving at the crash area for as long as possible. And there are more missing pieces. For example, all of John's flight instructors would be shocked to find out that according to Colonel Rourke and his friends, on this particular flight, John did not follow two of the most basic and routine safety procedures. He did not, according to the bad guys, file a flight plan. And, they say, he did not contact any of the radar facilities along the route of his flight to Martha's Vineyard. The reason for filing a flight plan with the FAA is that it tells the search and rescue people where to look for you if you go missing. John had always filed a flight plan before on all of his previous trips, but not this time. The missing flight plan is one of the main reasons given by Rourke and his friends for the 15-hour delay locating the crash. There are also several good reasons that a careful and conscientious pilot like John would always contact the air traffic control radar facilities along the route of a flight. First, contacting the controllers allows them to warn you of any hazards in your area. For example, if a jumbo jet has engine trouble and unexpectedly has to turn around and then comes barreling up behind you, the controllers can warn you if you contact them to watch out and they can tell you where to go to get out of the way. If a storm develops suddenly and comes sweeping into your flight path, the controllers can warn you if you contact them. In addition, when you contact them, the air traffic controllers give you an identifying radar code that you punch into a device on your plane called a radar transponder. Your onboard radar transponder then sends out a signal, which is picked up by the FAA's radar, so that your radar blip now tells them exactly who you are and what your altitude is. And, as we discussed before, when you contact the controllers, they enter your transponder's blip into the computer system so that if your plane descends below 100 feet anywhere but on the runway of your target airport, an alarm goes off in the FAA air traffic control facility telling the controllers to send a search and rescue team to come and get you. So contacting the controllers or not contacting them is not exactly a small deal and it was unheard of for John not to follow such a basic procedure. So Rourke and his friends say that John Kennedy never contacted anyone and never filed a flight plan. And idiots like this guy point to this as evidence to show that John was a careless, irresponsible daredevil who deserved to die. But, given Rourke's record of lying about everything else, the fact that Rourke says anything certainly doesn't mean that we should believe it. Maybe the opposite. And given John's 17-year record of careful, meticulous adherence to safety procedures, it seems more than likely that John did file a flight plan and that he did contact the air traffic control facilities along the route, but that his flight plan and all of his contacts with air traffic control somehow became missing pieces. John's plane had a simple cockpit voice recorder that should have preserved a record of the conversations and noise that took place during the last five minutes of the flight. But when the plane was recovered, the backup battery, which was necessary to preserve this information, was missing. And so, therefore, this critical information of what happened during John and Carolyn and Lauren's last moments is also missing. Is it possible that during the 15-hour delay, or later after the plane was recovered, that someone removed the battery in order to prevent us from knowing what transpired in the final minutes of the flight? 
But what would they accomplish by doing such a thing? What could they have been trying to hide? At this point, we can't even begin to guess. Witnesses saw John talking on the phone in the minutes before he took off. Who was he talking to? And what was he talking about? It's a small piece and may be unimportant, but at this point it attracts our attention because it's missing. It's supposed to be in the report. The NTSB is supposed to investigate this question. It's their routine to do so, and for obvious reasons. I mean, what if Kennedy had threatened to kill himself and his wife during this phone call? That would be important. Was he telling relatives not to wait up for him? That would help to explain the delay if it were true. Was he talking to a flight instructor, making plans or canceling plans? We don't know. The NTSB has the phone record, given the clear evidence in this case of a conspiracy by Rourke and others to hide the truth about what happened. The fact that it's missing should automatically attract our attention. Our response should be, it's missing, it must be important. Those who knew John's personal flying habits say that John kept his flight log in an aquamarine duffel on his plane. Witnesses familiar with John, his flight log, and this duffel were watching the news of the crash on CNN and saw this duffel being recovered among the debris from the crash. CNN's website also covered the story of the debris recovered after the crash and quotes a witness who specifically mentions this duffel as among items recovered by the police after it washed up on the beach at Martha's Vineyard. And you'll notice that this bag was described as being intact. So what? Well, according to the witnesses, if the bag was intact, it would have contained John's flight log. Again, so what? Who cares? I mean, why would anyone want to hide the flight log from us? Well, the flight log records who was on the plane, and it does this for one principal reason, so that if the plane crashes, we can recover the flight log and verify who was on the plane. Then we know how many bodies, living or dead, we should be looking for. The insurance companies know whose policy they have to pay out on and whose they don't. To the insurance companies, anyway, answering the question of who was on the plane is not a small deal. This question will become even more important in just a minute. Right now, the most important lesson I need you to have learned from the murder of JFK is how to smell a rat. Please recall how we saw that the reports from professional, reliable, on-the-scene witnesses of shots from the front disappeared. They were replaced by unsubstantiated reports that all the shots came from behind. The point is this. When rich and powerful bastards are killing a democratic leader, our best chance to find out the truth will come from the earliest reports. When we see these early reports from responsible, knowledgeable persons replaced by unsubstantiated reports from people with no name, no experience, the wrong job title, and no credibility, we should resist. We should demand to see credible, substantiated, supporting evidence before accepting the new version that someone is trying to sell us. We need to recognize that this exchanging of bad information for good by itself is evidence that supports a charge of conspiracy to murder. At this point, according to what the family has told us, it is believed that uh, Kennedy was the pilot of the plane and that in fact he was the only one, uh, the only pilot on board. There had been earlier reports that perhaps there had been a fourth passenger, a flight instructor, according to the family and what they have told us that is not the case. The family is also saying that they are not sure that uh, JFK Jr. had the proper license to pilot the plane last night, though the FAA has in fact not confirmed that. Now let's slow down and examine this statement very carefully. What does it tell us? The earliest reports said that there was a flight instructor on the plane. Please recognize then that the idea that a flight instructor was on the plane should not be casually dismissed even if later some nameless person known only as the family began running around telling all the media a couple of really controversial things. Let's take the second part about John Kennedy's pilot's license first. The family is also saying that they are not sure that uh, JFK Jr. had the proper license to pilot the plane last night, though the FAA has in fact not confirmed that. Jeez, John Kennedy didn't even have a license? What the hell did he think he was doing? Careless, irresponsible, stupid, rich kid, acting like a daredevil with his wife on board. Too bad about her, but hell, he deserved to die. 
This is the kind of ugly truth you would think the family might want to keep quiet about. But what if it weren't true? What kind of family member would say it to the press if it weren't true? It wasn't true. He was qualified. He, he had a private pilot single engine land license, which qualified him to fly this particular airplane in under visual flight rules. The weather observation at the Martha's Vineyard Airport at 9 o'clock was 8 miles visibility. That's well above the minimums needed for visual flight rules. At 10 o'clock it was 10 miles. We've heard from a number of people who were down on the vineyard and on the Cape last night that the moon was visible. Uh, so it, it's pretty apparent that the sky was not, uh, there was no cloud cover, at least not a significant cloud cover. So six or eight miles visibility, that would put it well into the category of visual flight rules so long as the ceiling was at a thousand feet or better. It wasn't true. Kennedy had 17 years experience, over 300 hours of flight time, enough to qualify to become an instructor. He had recently taken the performance test to get his instrument license, allowing him to fly blind in the thickest fog and passed. But the weather was clear and he was legal to fly even with his old license under visual flight rules. So why did this mysterious person named the family say it? Are there members of the Kennedy family who enjoy Kennedy bashing? The description of Oswald mysteriously going out over the police radio indicates that the killers had infiltrated the Dallas Police Department. This baseless false report suggests that the killers have some of their people identifying themselves as the family and spreading lies. But for now, let's simply make the point that the person calling themselves the family and telling these vicious lies about John's license is also the source of the story that there was no flight instructor. And now let's have a good hard look at the question of whether there was a flight instructor on the plane. The early report that there was indeed a flight instructor on the plane came from an entirely reliable source, Carol Radowell. Remember how the FAA ignored all the calls from the family and now claims that no one from the family ever told them anything about a plane being missing? Radowell is the clever and resourceful family friend who called the Coast Guard at 2 a.m. while other family members were sleeping. Radowell told the Coast Guard there was a flight instructor on the plane, but how could she know? She wasn't on the plane. The NTSB says that no cell phones were used after the plane was in the air, so how could she know for sure what changes may have taken place in the moments just before takeoff? These are very good questions, and it's clear that she couldn't know for sure if there was a flight instructor on board, but neither could anyone else. No one could know for sure. She was guessing. But all guesses are not created equal. There are a dozen good reasons for her and you to think that there was a flight instructor on that plane. John always had a flight instructor. It's just a fact. In the weeks after the accident, the NTSB investigators could find no one who had ever known of an incident where John flew his new plane without a flight instructor on board. As far as anyone knew, John never flew that plane without a flight instructor. There was a reason for this. John had owned this plane for a little less than two months. It was much more powerful than his old plane and had lots of high-tech safety features like a very sophisticated autopilot that could help him fly much more safely once he learned to use these sophisticated safety features. So he needed a flight instructor to teach him to use these fancy guidance systems. It's just a fact. It had been an unusually hazy summer. John had flown to Martha's Vineyard eight times in the previous month. Of course, each time he had a flight instructor with him, but on five of his eight most recent flights, visibility was so poor that it would have been illegal for John to fly without a flight instructor because his license was for visual flight rules only, meaning visibility of at least four miles. In Caldwell, New Jersey, as John was arriving at the airport, the afternoon was already turning extremely hazy. So John had every reason to think that he was going to need to have a flight instructor with him on this flight in order to be strictly legal. And according to all of his flight instructors, he never broke the rules and was always very cautious in his decision making. So for John to have taken off alone, flying into weather that looked hazy along a route that he knew usually had poor visibility would have been totally unlike him. We mentioned earlier that John and his sister-in-law, Lauren Bissett, arrived at the airport at 7.30.
Witnesses say Carolyn arrived 15 minutes later at 7.45, and yet, while conditions worsened, as the skies became more and more hazy, as the sun went down, the three of them sat around waiting for 45 minutes until 8.30 before taking off. Why? What were they waiting for? Can anyone suggest a more likely explanation or any other reasonable explanation at all other than that they were waiting for the flight instructor to show up? But suppose the scheduled flight instructor had not shown up. This would not be a problem for John. He routinely called them at a moment's notice for any sort of emergency. Things, Clark. Somebody originally said that he had a flight instructor because he was concerned about the cast on his, on his leg. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I heard uh, also someone suggest that he had a flight instructor with him because he is working on an instrument rating. And that's how you work on an instrument rating. You fly with the certified flight instructor uh, who sits in the right seat, you, are, you sit in the left seat and, as you normally would and, and you fly and the instructor's there to guide you and to take over, frankly, if, uh, you, know, if you get into any trouble. So th that, those could be the two reasons there was some suggestion or speculation that he might have had a flight instructor. Let's take these two reasons one at a time. The second one first. Kennedy was working on his instrument rating, but he had passed the written exam. He had passed the performance evaluation, but he needed to log hours so that he had every reason to fly with an instructor and no reason to fly without one. And now let's get back to that first point. Things, Clark. Somebody originally said that he had a flight instructor because he was concerned about the cast on his, on his leg. Mm -hmm. In fact, Kennedy had the cast removed from his ankle the day before, but he was still on crutches. He did not need his feet to fly, but he did need them to move the plane around while it was on the ground. Flying with the injury was not impossible or even dangerous, but it was inconvenient. And what do millionaires like John buy with their money? They buy convenience. It would have been much more convenient for John to have a flight instructor along. But we're just getting started with his foot injury. You see, lots of people who cared about John were worried about him flying with a broken foot. It may not have been a real threat, you don't need your feet to fly, but it was an obvious problem that easily attracted people's attention. The Boston Globe for July 19th quotes a Canadian business associate who says that John told him that, for the time being, he'd rather fly with a co-pilot because his broken foot made it difficult for him to operate the pedals controlling the rudder. Richard Blow his friend and co-editor at George Magazine had lunch with John on Friday afternoon, the day of the crash. Blow describes their lunchtime conversation and says that he told John he was worried about him flying with the injured ankle. Don't worry, he said. I'm flying with an instructor. An instructor. And what do you think his wife is going to say? Here you have a guy on crutches because he crashed his mini plane three weeks before. Every time Carolyn looked at him, what did she see? She sees a guy on crutches because he crashed his mini plane three weeks before. How likely is it, do you suppose, that his wife is going to get on his plane with him without a professional pilot on board? You do the math. Ask any married man if you need help. The chances of her getting on that plane are a lot less than zero. It is incontrovertible that in the last seconds before takeoff, Kennedy may in fact have taken on a flight instructor. How can anyone say for certain that he didn't until the wreckage and the flight log were recovered? Oh wait, they claim they didn't recover the flight log. That means there's no official record of who was on the plane. And it's well recognized that in ocean disasters, just because they didn't find your body doesn't mean you weren't there. For example, when they finally located the wreckage, the Coast Guard and the Navy scoured the bottom for every piece of available evidence. Thousands of small pieces were recovered. Nevertheless, in spite of their search, one of the seats is missing. This seat wasn't eaten or dragged off by sharks. It's rather extraordinary that it should be missing since all the other seats were trapped in the wreckage. How did this one get loose and how did it get away? A minor point, maybe. The major point is this. If a large, durable, inedible piece of the plane is missing, why not a body, which could certainly have been dragged off and eaten in the five days that it took to recover the bodies? So, strictly speaking, without the official flight log showing who was on the plane, even today it would be irresponsible for anyone to try to state definitively that there was no flight instructor on board that plane. We cannot say for sure. We just don't know. 
Radwell may have been only guessing that John Kennedy Jr. had a flight instructor on the plane, but her guess is supported by an enormous amount of evidence. And while Radwell could not have known for certain that there was a flight instructor, the likelihood that John would have had a professional pilot on board is overwhelming. So then why did all the news reporters, every one, throw out Radwell's story in favor of one that could not be verified then and cannot be verified even now? Oswald was arrested because he matched a description that came from out of nowhere. Unseen forces, invisible to us even today, infiltrated the Dallas police and planted this description. Who, calling themselves the family, told the outright lie that John did not have the necessary license to fly and at the very same time began spreading the utterly baseless story that there was no flight instructor? And why did all the news accept this baseless story? Are you starting to detect a dark presence at work here? The lying of Colonel Rourke, the FAA saying that they didn't get any of the many phone calls the family made, the incredible 15-hour delay in sending search craft to the crash site, the mass of other missing pieces. This information is disturbing for what it suggests. It smells really bad, but the outline of what's really going on is far from clear. Let's see if we can sharpen the picture to get a better view of what's going on and who's involved. In their final report, a year after the accident, the NTSB featured the dramatic story that one of John's flight instructors had offered to fly with him, but that Kennedy told him that, quote, he wanted to do it alone. This story dominated the news about the final report, as well it might. Stories of Kennedy's killing themselves are red meat for the press. They love it. Another Kennedy turns out to be a careless, irresponsible, stupid bastard who killed himself and his lovely wife. Too bad about her. But wait a minute. If this is such hot stuff, and it is, how come it didn't come out in the days right after the crash? The government did a better job than the media in digging up this story? That's a little strange, isn't it? I can answer that question. Yes, it is. So maybe we need to have a closer look at where this story comes from. ABC, the LA Times, and everybody else got their information from the NTSB final report. But this doesn't tell us very much. For example, who is this second CFI? What did he say? And when did he say it? Well, the certified flight instructor, or CFI, is named Robert Morena, and according to this memo, written six months after the accident, he told the NTSB about this conversation he had with John Jr. on the morning of the day he died. This is real, real live drama, eh? You offer to fly with someone of JFK Jr.'s stature, and he turns down your offer of help, and then he crashes. Wow. That would be hard to live with, don't you think? Hard to keep to yourself. Man, you would want to right away pick up the phone and tell your mama. You would tell your best friend right away. It would weigh so hard on you that you would tell strangers standing next to you waiting for the bus. And he probably did, right? But you know the government. They take six months to do the paperwork after a trip to the bathroom. They probably took six months to get around to asking this guy, right? Uh, no, they talked to him on July 21st, five days after the accident. It seems to have been a long interview, plenty of time and opportunity for this flight instructor, Morena, to mention this conversation he had with John. But maybe the issue of John flying alone never came up. Uh, no, it seems that they talked about that and how John never did fly alone. Well, maybe for some inexplicable reason, Morena somehow forgot to bring up the conversation he had with John that morning. For some reason, he just didn't think of it. Uh, no, it seems that's not going to get it either. You see, this letter, written just five days after the crash, tells us that the only reason for Morena not to have mentioned during his NTSB interview that he had had this conversation with John is that he had already brought up this last conversation, the morning of the flight, in this letter and had nothing new to add. Only he failed to mention one thing in this letter. Where's the part about John saying he wanted to do it alone? You got me. I don't see it. I can't explain it. So I called Morena. I said, you know, your lawyer says that he spoke with you and that he asked you about your last conversation with John and that you told him that you never had any conversation with John about his plans to fly that night with or without a flight instructor. Morena didn't try to explain it. He said, whatever I told the NTSB, that's what happened. Then he excused himself and hung up the phone. 
Whatever I told the NTSB, that's what happened. But you see, Bob, that's part of the problem. I don't know what you told the NTSB. Not only because you told your lawyer that you didn't say anything to the NTSB about John wanting to do it alone, but I also don't know what you told the NTSB because the NTSB violated the most basic procedures in preparing this document. You see, in any official government interview by any official government agency, they're supposed to tell us when and where the interview was done. If no lawyer is present, they're supposed to acknowledge that the interviewee knows that he has a right to have one present, and when they're done with the interview, they're supposed to type up a summary like this one, and then they are supposed to have the interviewee sign it, as they had Christopher Benway do here, verifying that the contents of the interview summary are correct. But there is no such verification on this letter. Did Morena say it? He wouldn't answer the question. David Muzio, the NTSB investigator who prepared this nasty piece of work refused to talk to me and referred me to a supervisor who would not answer the phone, would not return messages, would not answer letters or emails. But now let's review. 1. Five days after the assassination, I mean after the plane crash, Morena writes a letter for the NTSB where he mentions having a last conversation with John the morning of the crash, but he doesn't mention John telling him he wanted to do it alone. 2. Later the same day, Morena is interviewed at length by the NTSB, but the summary of that interview doesn't contain any mention of any last conversation. 3. Six months later, the NTSB writes a memo saying Morena has suddenly remembered the crucial details of this crucial conversation. The unverified memo says nothing about how, when, or where Morena was interviewed. And 4. A month after that, in response to an NTSB inquiry, Morena's lawyer says that this sudden recollection is false, never happened. In fact, although we cannot say for certain one way or the other, the weight of the evidence suggests that not only did John Kennedy not tell Morena that he wanted to do it alone, indeed, the weight of the evidence suggests that there was, in fact, a flight instructor on that plane. Nevertheless, Morena's utterly incredible story was put into the NTSB final report and was then carried as the lead story in all the major media. I'm not implying, I'm saying, you can put this stuff on your roses, but don't you dare swallow it. How could the NTSB have accepted this story? How could they have included it in their final report without mentioning the lawyer's letters and the other glaring inconsistencies? And how could they have claimed to be finished with their investigation without resolving any of these inconsistencies? I don't get it. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I do. But we're supposed to be able to learn from our past experiences. We're supposed to know something by now about how the bad guys manipulate the news when they kill one of the good guys. And if we have learned anything, we should be ready then to bet the farm that there was a flight instructor on that plane. So they're trying to make us think there was no flight instructor. That means there was one. Okay. Makes no particular sense, but okay. So they must have delayed the rescue for 15 hours so they could recover this guy's body. Am I missing something? Is there some other possible explanation? Well, at least now we have an explanation for the delay. It's a lousy explanation, but it's all we've got. Apparently, they pulled this guy out still trapped in his seat, which is why one of the seats was missing. Okay, this is crazy, but it's the only remotely reasonable explanation for what we know happened. I mean, why else present this dubious crap to us to make us think there was no flight instructor? Why else delay the rescue for 15 hours? I mean, that delaying of the rescue, what a mess. ABC got the beacon. The freaking Coast Guard spokesman, Todd Bergun, is running around telling everybody about how Kennedy contacted the tower, forcing Senator Kennedy to wake up Clinton just to get a plane in the air. All of this screaming evidence that something dark and evil is going on. Why would they do it? Okay, well now we have an answer. They did all of this provocative stuff because they didn't want the search and rescue craft to get to the crash site until they had time to recover the body of the flight instructor, get the logbook, and remove the battery from the cockpit voice recorder. But why? Maybe I should just let it lay, but I won't. I guess it's just the kind of animal I am. Maybe I'm a little bit like them that way. See, they could have just left it alone too and they didn't. 
I mean, suppose they let the news people keep the story that a flight instructor was on the plane, and suppose the body of a flight instructor got recovered. What does that prove to a suspicious guy like me? I can tell you what. Not a damn thing. But the instant, the millisecond, I heard that the story had changed, that suddenly there was no flight instructor, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. No fooling. I knew right then I had to start looking as deep as I could go. And the way things are now with the evidence we now have in hand, the one thing that is clear here is the presence of an unseen hand at work trying to guide us to think that there was no flight instructor on the plane. And to me, that about proves that there was one. You may think that sounds crazy, but now answer me this then. Why did they steal the father's body and alter his wounds? Why? No good reason, but they did it. And because they did it, we now have three eyewitnesses to the deed, giving us our only real clear proof of government involvement in the conspiracy to murder. Thank you very much. It was a stupid idea for them to have did it. What can they gain by it? Nothing. The government doctors were going to lie about the wounds. Dr. Humes was going to say what they told him to say. It didn't matter what the wounds looked like. But they went ahead and they did it anyway for the pure pleasure of doing it, because that's just the kind of animals they are. Well... Come on if you're coming. I'm going in after him. Ain't no help for it. It's just the kind of animal I am. Way down the hole, miles past the lies that showed up on the evening news, hundreds of pages past anything we've looked at so far, 333 pages deep into a 450-page report, we stumble upon a casual discussion of the fuel selector valve. The fuel selector valve was removed and examined. The valve itself was found in the off position. Now stop. Take your shoes off and get ready to set a spell because if we're looking for something outrageous, this is it. This is what we came for, ready? Now think for a moment. You don't have to be a genius or an aviation expert to wonder at the meaning of these nine words. The fuel selector valve in the off position will cut off gasoline to the engine. Let's take this one step at a time. First, you can't fly very far with the valve in the off position. So that means the valve had to have been moved to this position in the last moments that the plane was in the air. This is an obvious point, but absolutely mind-boggling. These nine words tell us that as John Kennedy's plane was suddenly and catastrophically launched into a headfirst disastrous plunge towards the sea, John, or his wife, or someone on that plane was overcome by an uncontrollable urge to fiddle with the fuel selector valve. This is absolutely the strangest thing imaginable. It is literally unbelievable. Try it yourself. Get out the yellow pages, look up flight schools, call one up, talk to the guy in charge, and ask him what he thinks of the idea that the fuel selector valve of John Kennedy's plane was found in the off position. He won't believe you. Don't get mad or insulted, but you just better recognize. If we came down this hole looking for something strange, we have found it. We can go home now. Just kidding. We're just getting started. The point is, this is strange. It is obviously strange. You don't have to be a genius, an expert in aviation, or even particularly insightful to see that. Hey, wait. I know. That's it. Why didn't I think of that before? Why didn't you think of that before? Why didn't the NTSB think of that? Kennedy accidentally turned off the gasoline supply to the engine, the motor died, and down they went. No? Uh, no, you it see. Could, but an engine failure in and of itself would not force the airplane to make that kind of a spectacular dive. These airplanes, believe it or not, do have a capability of gliding. I'm not sure what it is in the Piper uh, Saratoga, but in the particular airplane that I fly, for example, fully loaded at gross weight, which is 3,880 pounds, it will glide two miles for every thousand feet of altitude. So if you're at 5,000 feet, presumably, under the right circumstances and at the proper airspeed and the right attitude, you could glide about 10 miles. So if you accidentally turn off the fuel selector valve, you can still glide at 2,500 feet for five miles to a soft landing. On the way down, you get on the radio and help is on the way. You're not gonna be in the water for more than a few minutes. You may not even get wet. Except, hey, John John, you dummy. Why don't you just turn the valve back on and start the motor up? Oh yeah, okay, very good. Well, so we figured out all by ourselves that the plane didn't crash because that dummy John John turned off the fuel selector valve.
But don't be lazy. Be hardworking, determined, and thorough. Make a few calls. Call up some experts. Get out the yellow pages and call up these flight school guys. And again, ask a few more questions about fuel selector valves. Uh, Mr. Wizard, what's a fuel selector valve? Well, Jimmy, an airplane fuel selector valve has two primary uses. The first one has to do with distributing the weight of the gasoline evenly on the plane during the flight. You see, any aircraft must carry a great deal of fuel that is going to fly over a long distance without stopping to refuel every few minutes. In a Piper Saratoga, the gas tanks are located here and here. The large tanks each hold about 51 gallons of fuel. But you see, Jimmy, the fuel not only takes up a good deal of room on the plane, it also weighs a great deal. And as you can imagine, on any plane, it is very important to keep the weight evenly distributed. A lopsided plane will be difficult, even dangerous, to maneuver. It is for this reason the pilot must monitor the weight of the gasoline in each tank and use the fuel selector valves switching back and forth between the tanks to keep the weight in the tanks more or less equal and the plane balanced. However, the fuel selector valve also has an off position. That seems like a crazy thing, Mr. Wizard, and dangerous too. Why would anybody ever want to cut off the fuel to the engine in an airplane? That's a good question, Jimmy. But now let me ask you another. Suppose you're flying along at 5,000 feet when suddenly your engine develops a small gasoline leak near the motor. And suppose, as is likely to happen, the gasoline from the leak catches fire. What are you going to do? The fire will turn the small leak into a large leak. The small fire will turn into a large fire. The wind will make the fire spread quickly. And while you and your friends are burning to death, you might even think to crash your plane headfirst into the sea at 200 miles an hour just to end your terrible suffering. I know. I know what to do, Mr. Wizard. I'll turn the fuel valve to off. That'll cut off the fuel to the motor. Without any gasoline, the fire will burn itself out, and I can glide for miles to a nice, safe landing. Why, of course, Jimmy. How right you are, clever child. So you see, boys and girls, the fuel valve is not installed on airplanes so that clumsy pilots can accidentally kill their motors and find themselves in a needless crash. It's a safety feature, of course. But there's one more thing you should know before you go. The FAA knows that not all pilots out there are young safety prodigies like young Jimmy here. Some are even accident-prone, and that's why every fuel selector valve has a special safety feature, an idiot button. You see, you cannot accidentally turn the fuel valve to off. It simply can't be done. The fuel valve can only be turned off in an emergency situation by holding down this button while simultaneously turning the fuel selector lever. Thus, the accidental turning off of the lever is a virtual impossibility, even in planes whose pilots may be accident-prone. It simply can't be done accidentally. Then how in the heck did the fuel valve end up in the off position in John Kennedy's plane, Mr. Wizard? Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Indeed. Thanks a lot, Einstein. That really helps. It couldn't happen by accident. That means someone in the plane had to have done it on purpose, in the seconds before they all died. Oh, well, that clears everything up, right? Uh... Well, no, not really. In fact, not even a little bit. This doesn't answer anything. It just creates more questions. Like, how come nobody at NTSB thought it was even worth mentioning? I mean, you want headlines. John Kennedy killed himself. Apparently distraught over his millions of dollars, fame, good looks, his successful magazine, and beautiful wife, he decided to end it all by deliberately flipping the switch on his fuel selector valve, cutting off fuel to his engine. The plane then glided smoothly for another three miles, during which time rescue assets were able to mobilize and arrive. Oh, uh, wait, that's right. You can't really kill yourself by turning off the fuel selector valve. So, new headline. While John Kennedy Jr.'s plane was falling out of the sky, rushing catastrophically towards the sea, he, or someone on that plane, decided that since they couldn't save their own lives, they might as well conserve resources by cutting off fuel to the engine. Do you like that one any better? No? It doesn't really work, does it? You can't really kill yourself by turning off the fuel selector valve. But you can kill yourself by grabbing the controls and pushing them violently forward, throwing your plane into the sea at 200 miles per hour. This radar analysis is part of the NTSB report. It's buried at page 321 of the report, but it's one of the most basic and important pieces of the evidence in any investigation. Any news hound who wanted to could have gotten a look at it. This line shows the tail end of the plane's very gradual descent from 5,500 to 2,200 feet. Kennedy had not yet contacted the tower at this point, and FAA regulations require that you contact the tower before descending below 2,500 feet. So, being the meticulous pilot that he was, John brought the plane back up to 2,500 feet. 
and contacted the tower. We don't know how long that conversation lasted, but if it lasted one minute, as soon as it was over, the plane began a catastrophic plunge into the sea. The conclusion seems obvious, doesn't it? It doesn't seem to matter what view you look at, south to north or east to west. It does not appear to be an accidental crash. It certainly looks as though someone on that plane decided to commit suicide the fun way with a bunch of other people. There's no spiral to be detected in these depictions of the radar evidence. There's no disorienting movement of the plane of any kind. No one was able to find any evidence in the wreckage of an explosion, fire, or other catastrophe. It appears then as though someone grabbed the controls of the plane and pushed them violently forward. How could the NTSB have missed this? How is it not worth mentioning as a possibility? How did the sharks in the media not go nuts over this blood-red evidence of more Kennedy self-destruction? I don't know, but those aren't really the questions I'm trying to answer here. You see, I'm still hung up on that freaking fuel valve. I mean, let's say John decided for no apparent reason to kill himself, his wife, and his sister-in-law in his mother's front yard. That's right, isn't that sweet? The plane crashed just offshore of Jackie Kennedy's house on Martha's Vineyard, where John and his mother and sister spent many happy summer days. Some of the debris from the crash actually washed up on the beach in front of her house. So let's say that he decided to do that. And he decided to do it on the day before his cousin Rory's wedding, just to ruin the memory of her wedding in everyone's mind forever so that they could remember the occasion the way he remembered his third birthday as one of the saddest days of their lives. Okay, let's just accept the obvious for the sake of simplicity that someone on that plane decided to commit suicide in the most monumentally ugly and hurtful way anyone possibly could think of. But the thing that's still bugging me is that John, or whoever committed murder-suicide, paused to carefully and deliberately turn the fuel valve on. Just in case the engine were to catch fire on the way down, this is still a freaking nutty explanation. Can't we come up with something that makes a little sense? But there it is. What you going to do? Ignore it? Deny it? Lie about it? Well, that's been done pretty well up till now, and we didn't come all this way just to close our eyes to the stuff we found. We came to see what we could see. So let's keep looking, right? I mean, what else? Keep looking, keep asking those questions. So I opened the yellow pages again and started calling up flight instructors again, talking to the ones who felt like talking, talking about pilots who crash, talking about fuel selector valves, and pilots who turn their fuel selector valves to off as they are casually committing murder-suicide by plunging their planes full of people into the sea. It seems that it happens more often than you might imagine. You see, I was talking to this one old boy about John Kennedy's fuel valve, and he says, Yeah, that's mighty strange, all right, but strange things will happen sometimes, you know. But hey, now, I know another strange fuel valve story. You know that guy in Egypt here, 990? He turned off the fuel selector valve. And I said, What? And he said, Yeah. You know, there was that flight out of New York City, Egypt Air 990, 15 weeks after John Jr.'s crash. There was a plane full of Egyptian military people, and right after takeoff, one of the pilots walks into the cockpit and says something about Allah Akbar, and bang, he grabbed the controls, the yoke, the steering thingy, and he pushed it all the way forward, sending the plane plunging straight down towards the ocean. Well, there's about five other pilots standing around, and they all jumped on this one maniac and pulled him away from the controls. And then they started struggling, pulling back on their steering yoke, trying to pull the plane out of the dive. But the plane had gathered speed and momentum, and a big airliner doesn't want to turn very easily under the best of circumstances, and so these guys are really struggling. And so while all the pilots are occupied with trying to bring the plane out of its dive, the maniac simply turns around and pushes the idiot button and turns the plane's fuel valves to off, instantly killing the engines. Now without engine power, a 757 is a hulking dead weight, and the plane simply continued its natural course, plunging into the sea, killing 217 people. Damn. Well, thank you, Professor. That's a hell of a story. And folks, that's just the beginning. Egypt Air 990 hit the water 50 miles from where John Kennedy Jr.'s plane went down. Now there's a coincidence for you. And I should probably mention, no one in Egypt buys this story. First, outside of military operations, Muslims don't commit suicide. It's just not part of their culture. Secondly, the family insists that he had nothing to be suicidal about. 
His family loved him, his career was solid, his life was good. So many Egyptians think that it's more likely that the plane was taken out by an Israeli missile in order to kill all the military people on board. But the black boxes were recovered, which not only recorded the sounds of the pilots' voices and the sounds of the struggle, but a second black box recorded the readings from all the gauges and the movements of any levers and instruments used by the pilots to control the plane, including the steering wheel thingy, the steering yoke, and the fuel selector valve. Well, there's a third explanation. See if you like it any better. According to this theory of what happened, the maniac pilot on Egypt Air 990 was a Manchurian candidate. He'd been hypnotized, programmed, brainwashed by some country's intelligence agency to kill himself and everyone else on that plane by pushing the controls forward. But most importantly for our investigation, this theory says he had also been programmed to then turn the fuel selector valve to off. He had been programmed to do it three months after someone on John Kennedy's plane did exactly the same thing. What do you mean programmed? Hollywood has made two movies in the last 40 years with the title The Manchurian Candidate. Both movies tell the story of individuals who have been programmed through mind control techniques to murder political figures. The films are not based on fantasy. You can scarcely imagine how delicate and easily manipulated the human mind is. The next time a hypnotist entertainer is in town, take in the show. This fuel valve business made me want to know more about hypnotism, so I went to see this guy, Mark Sweet. You would not believe it if you hadn't seen it. Only a handful of the people who volunteered and got up on the stage actually went under and were hypnotized. But those who were would believe anything this guy said and therefore do anything this guy asked. Here he tells two of them that their butts are glued to the seat and they can only free themselves by wagging their tongues around in the air. Believe me, if that bench had had an airline steering yoke attached to it and Mark told them to push it violently forward and then turn off the fuel control valves, they would have done it. After the show, we talked to them and their families. This was not a setup. But don't take my word for it. Go yourself. The CIA has been studying the potential of hypnotism to fulfill their requirements for mind control for 40 years. They would like you to believe that in 40 years they've learned nothing. Of course, they're lying. But how much is there to study? Using hypnosis, Mark can make a person do anything. The only difficulty, then, is that not everyone is easily hypnotized. You can bet, then, that the CIA spent the last 40 years messing with people's minds, trying to figure out how to hypnotize anybody they want. This guy was just fooling around. The CIA, however, was not. The CIA has conducted mind control experiments under the title MK Ultra for 50 years, many of them at this Canadian hospital. Here, the CIA's fascist scientist, Dr. Gottlieb, used all kinds of fancy techniques in his experiments. They would use intensive electroshock and LSD and other disorienting drugs to, in his terms, depattern individuals, basically to wipe the slate clean. Second, using tape-recorded messages, try to program in new behaviors by repeating these messages hundreds of thousands of times while the victim was immobilized with other drugs. And uh, the final phase was to try to wipe the slate clean so that people could not, again, remember what had happened to them but still have the new behavior. All without getting permission from anyone. Now, it doesn't take long to figure out why the CIA or other intelligence agencies would be interested in such research. Indeed, the goal of this program was to create Manchurian candidates, individuals who would go out and do whatever they had been programmed to do, including political assassinations, and who would remember nothing about their programming when their assignment was over. There is important and credible evidence that John Lennon's killer, Bobby Kennedy's killer, George Wallace's and Ronald Reagan's would-be assassins were Manchurian candidates, victims of this kind of mind control. It seems, in fact, that after the fiasco of the murder of President Kennedy, which fooled only 20% of the population, the Manchurian candidate has become the method of choice used by these killers for removing those who get in their way. So what? So, these monsters certainly have the capacity, the ability, the means to program people to kill themselves on an airplane full of people. The question is not can they, the question is did they. Well, you be the judge and ask yourself the question. 
how likely is it that two different pilots from two different cultures trained in two different countries with no discernible personal problems would choose to commit suicide by killing themselves and everyone else on board their aircraft by plunging their planes into the sea on two separate occasions separated by only 50 miles in a hundred days and how likely is it that both pilots in the midst of their death plunge into the sea would just coincidentally decide to while away the seconds before their deaths by turning off the fuel to the engines? I can answer that question. It's impossibly unlikely. It is not reasonable to call it a coincidence. Virtually any explanation that doesn't involve fairies or witches would be more likely, more reasonable than the suggestion that it was merely a coincidence. I mean, it's not like they teach you in pilot school that when committing murder-suicide with your plane and its passengers, don't forget to turn off the fuel valve just in case someone tries to stop you. But if they don't teach you in flight school, where do you go to learn these sort of sophisticated, cold-blooded, suicidal skills? Oh, yeah. It's an obvious point, then, isn't it, that the suicidal pilots on both planes were programmed by the same people. We've identified their modus operandi. The fact of these two closed fuel valves on both aircrafts is the smoking gun. It's not only the killer's fingerprints, it's their signature. The monsters who created these mass murders signed their names with a flourish at the bottom of their artwork. Well, there you are. That's it. We're about at the bottom of this old rabbit hole. And there's not a lot left to do now except to remind ourselves why we came. Why did we come here? What were we looking for? We came here looking for evidence that we were hoping would help us to develop a theory about what happened and that would help us to answer some of the glaring questions left unanswered by the official explanation, the official theory of what happened. We came hoping to be able to develop a theory that would explain the facts in this case in a manner that wasn't ridiculous. Well, we've done that, I think. Now, the evidence in this case is not complete, but please remember that it doesn't have to be. The evidence proving how the solar system operates would be considered incomplete, incredibly complex, difficult to understand, and virtually unprovable to the ordinary person until the start of interplanetary space travel 50 years ago. Now, if most thinking people didn't accept Galileo's version of the solar system as soon as they heard it 400 years ago, they did accept it as soon as they compared it to the Pope's ridiculous story about giant crystal wheels rolling around inside a giant crystal ball. Galileo's theory of the solar system was based on very, very incomplete evidence, but it explained all of the evidence and it tied it together in a way that made sense. The theory that there was a flight instructor on the plane who was programmed to crash it into the sea is supported by all the evidence that there is, but it is incomplete. For example, at this point, I can't tell you the name of the missing flight instructor. Maybe he was a prisoner, or a low-level contract agent, or maybe just some poor slob they dragged off the street and into one of their programming facilities. And the evidence is complicated. But knowing what we know about the forces of evil in this country, it shouldn't really require that much imagination to see this story as the most real and reasonable explanation of the evidence, especially when we compare this theory to the competing theory put forward by the NTSB that an experienced, skilled, and careful pilot in a reliable aircraft with advanced safety features suddenly and for no apparent reason fell like a stone out of the sky. The NTSB theory can't begin to explain why the FAA ignored phone calls from a senator all night long. It doesn't explain why Bergen's story of radio contact was covered up. It can't explain Rourke's outrageous lies and mischaracterizations or all of the many missing pieces. And it sure in hell can't explain that fuel selector valve. With the theory of the program flight instructor, however, we can explain it all in a reasonable and coherent way. The plan was to commit the perfect crime, to grab the body of their Manchurian candidate, pull him out of the wreckage, and whisk him away, leaving no evidence of their crime. No one could ever possibly figure out how they did it. And they left no evidence, except for the 15-hour delay dispatching the search and rescue craft to the crash site. They must have let Georgie, Dick, and Rummy get involved and as they have with the economy, energy, post-war Iraq, and Hurricane Katrina, they totally screwed it up. They let the plane sink. And then rather than go with plan B and just let the flight instructor's body get recovered, they created this outrageous delay, without which this investigation would never have begun. 
The NTAP location was withheld from the Coast Guard and the Civil Air Patrol from 5 a.m. when it was available until the luggage began to wash up on the shore at 1 p.m. in order to give the bad guys time to recover the body of the flight instructor. Do you doubt me? They were out there. They were seen out there. Listen to this. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Stanley of the Civil Air Patrol, we appreciate uh, your talking to us. If Kelly Cuthill is still standing by... Richard Stanley has been out searching the dry land areas of Martha's Vineyard since 7.30 a.m. He's now speaking at 12.15 a.m. Listen closely. In case uh, the plane, now, in fact, had gone down... Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, going back to what you had, you said you heard rumors of uh, an NTAP uh, west of... Uh, That's Island. correct, yes. Yeah. I saw the Coast Guard out there. That's the only thing I had that would hint in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are reports that there were uh, radar contacts within a few miles uh, west of, of the vineyard. But yeah, so you okay. did see Coast Guard vessels out there searching? Not vessels. Uh, helicopters. Coast Guard helicopters? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure thing. Um, now, wait a minute. Okay, Stanley is speaking at 1215 about events he saw early that morning. Admiral Richard Larrabee of the Coast Guard said several times that the Coast Guard did not get the information necessary to begin a focused search until 1 p.m. And by about 1 o'clock this afternoon, uh, we had narrowed that focus down to an area of about 17 miles uh, southwest of Martha's Vineyard. A few minutes after the interview with Richard Stanley, Todd Bergen, the Coast Guard information officer, said the same thing, that he and the Coast Guard didn't have any radar information. Yes. And that's the last time the plane was heard from? That is correct. At approximately 2,500 feet, 10 miles offshore? That's my understanding. Uh, I, I, like I said, as far as that, that radar location, I do not have that information. Officer, is there anything that I feel? Remember at the Pentagon News Conference, at about 1.30, Colonel Rourke insisted that despite the radar information, that they were not focusing on one area. We'll, we'll continue on the same track that we're on, uh, which is to search the entire area. All these people say there was no information that would lead to a focused search of the waters off Martha's Vineyard, and yet Richard Stanley says... Correct, yes. yeah. I saw the Coast Guard out there. That's the only thing I had that would hint in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are... No one was focusing on the crash site, but Stanley says he saw what he took to be the Coast Guard conducting a focused search off the west coast of Martha's Vineyard early in the morning. But that's not possible. In fact, just to be clear, the Coast Guard says it wasn't them. But if it wasn't the Coast Guard, then who was it? Well, we have an answer to that now, don't we? Granted, the evidence in this case is circumstantial. But that doesn't make it crazy to bring George W. up on charges. Crazy? Hell, it's not even unusual. It is part one of the absolutely basic standard operating procedure for any criminal prosecution, a two-step process that has put tens of thousands of Americans, perhaps hundreds of thousands, in prison today using less evidence than can be presented in this case. Step one of the process is to review the evidence, so let's do that quickly. One, the guy's father was a murderer. John's refusal to accept the official version of his father's murder, his promotion of Oliver Stone, his commitment to publishing bold and important truths about the crimes committed by governments against their own citizens, and his real potential to seek and win high government office all made John a very real threat to the monsters who killed his father. 2. Bush Sr. earned the oil mafia support for his presidency by killing John Kennedy Sr. His reward for participating in this murder was not only a place at the table of these killers, but, as we have seen, their guaranteed, undying support for his political career no matter how many times he lost. They picked him up, sewed him back together, and promoted him to higher and higher positions of political power. 3. Georgie is clearly now a leading member of this oil mafia, secretly sworn to serve their interests. While he has been president, the oil mafia's profits and prospects have soared through the roof. Of course, the American people pay. He may only be a stooge at this table, but he is a stooge not only with a seat, but with his own little name place marker at the table of this mafia that you have to earn your membership in by committing a murder. So point four in the evidence is that George W., like his father, would also have to kill somebody to five get the oil mafia to support him instead of McCain, and to get a place at their table, like his father before him. So who? That's the obvious question, isn't it? It should be the obvious question. Who do you suppose these sick and twisted bastards decided Georgie should kill to make his bone? They decided, The father kills a father.
the sun should kill the sun. They like the poetry of it. We have proved that John Kennedy Jr. was murdered. Can any reasonable person look at this mountain of evidence in the death of JFK Jr. and not see clear, unmistakable signs of foul play? We have part one of the requirements to bring this case to court. Very powerful circumstantial evidence, the only explanation for which is murder. Now. The best explanation, the most reasonable explanation, the most probable explanation for the available evidence will be accepted as proof in a criminal case if and only if it is also the only reasonable explanation. That is, if the only other explanation is ridiculously and unreasonably improbable, leaving no reasonable doubt. If this were a court case, George W. Bush would have to prove a reasonable alternative explanation for the facts we have presented here. He'd have to give a reasonable explanation for why the Dark Lord supported a coke-addled, draft-dodging loser instead of John McCain. He'd have to explain the FAA's ignorings of Senator Kennedy and Rourke's lies and that absolutely amazing fuel selector valve. He'd have to present a reasonable alternative explanation for these unusual events or... Da, 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 da. He would have to provide an alibi for where he was on July 16, 1999, and he doesn't have one. Why the hell didn't his staff know where he was? Was he in bed with Colin, or was he in bed with Condoleezza, or both? Or was he in a boat with Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Richard Myers in the waters off Martha's Vineyard, waiting for a plane to come down? In any case, it's very simple. All Georgie has to do is provide a credible alibi. But, you know, this is not an easy thing for a guy like Bush. Wherever he says he was, we're going to want to know who was with him. All of those people he might name lead very public lives. They never carry cash. There are dozens of credit card transactions providing evidence of where they all were that weekend. The people who work at the hotels and restaurants where he might claim to have stayed would remember whether he was there the day John Kennedy Jr. died. Who was he with? His friends all have secretaries who keep their calendars of where they were. Do you think all of those calendars of all of those people are going to match his? Not if they are all lying. Remember, these are the guys who screw up everything they touch. For example, George's father claims that he knew nothing about the Iran-Contra weapons cocaine terrorism scandal. And Bush's personal calendar slash date book shows him out of town on the dates that the meetings were held to plan these crimes. But Ollie North who did all the day-to-day -day grunt work of this dark and murderous business, he also had a calendar slash date book, and his book shows that Bush chaired the planning meetings. So let Georgie answer the question, where were you? And when he does, and it's proved a lie, the same thing will happen to him that happens to every other person accused of murder based on circumstantial evidence when their alibi is proved to be a lie. He'll be convicted. The United States and the world, really, is infested with a cancer, a sick criminal mafia. These people invented state-sponsored race-based slavery and racism. They killed Lincoln so that they could then instigate a war of extermination against the Plains Indians. In the 1900s, these sick and twisted racist killers instituted immigration quotas to keep inferior races out of the USA, like the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, and the Chinese. These racist monsters didn't just support Hitler, they created Hitler. The Holocaust was a disaster for the German war effort, but these vermin made a trillion dollars off of it. Hitler lost World War II, but they won. A few years later, they murdered John Kennedy in hopes of making another trillion dollars off the Vietnam War. If you don't know that they blew up the World Trade Center, you're not trying hard enough. Certainly, in the aftermath of 9-11, they have picked our pockets for several hundred billion dollars more. The Patriot Act makes it look as though they plan to permanently destroy democracy in America. Their plans for the environment are threatening the very existence of the human race. What are you going to do about it? Whatever it is, you better get on it. Martin Luther King said it. These sickles are only powerful when good people do nothing. Cesar Chavez said it. These turds are only powerful if we let them be. I can't say it better than this guy. Now is the time to fight this dehumanization. Now is the time to realize you're special and you have power and you can affect change and that we're in a war for the very future of humanity. It's that important and you're a soldier on the front line. So get out there and take it back to them, 110%. You don't have a choice, ladies and gentlemen. Run your own life or somebody else is going to run it for you. 
For the sake of your children and grandchildren, don't keep silent. At the very least, school them. Give them this video. Give them the tools, the knowledge they need to take up this fight if they have the courage. This video is their real history. It may be the only real history they'll ever get in their lives. Your action, even if